I kind of like to come down here and think. A Sunday morning walk around the site sometimes does more good than a week of meetings and phone calls. Well, for me, anyhow. Get a better chance to reflect on the whole project, how everything is coming together, and on what potential problems might be cropping up. It's important to keep an overview on everything, especially when you're putting together something the size of Ontario Place. first decisions, of course, was where to build it. Well, when we added up all the factors, like where the greatest audience potential lies and how the transportation systems worked in, there was no other answer. It just had to be here. But I think what really turned Ontario Place into something unique, something exciting, was the decision to build it offshore from Toronto's exhibition park. The decision to go offshore gave the project a chance to grow and do something really worthwhile. It helped the architects come up with a completely new pavilion design, a building that takes advantage of both the land and the water. And it gave us room to build boutiques and restaurants, to include an 8,000 capacity outdoor amphitheater, a 300 boat marina, reflecting pools, picnic areas and beaches. But that was back in 1968. They were still only plans. We had to start building from nothing, just water. The first trucks rolled onto the site in what, uh, April 69, I guess. We've sure filled in a lot of lakes since then. There's been something like two million cubic yards of fill dumped here in less than two years. The site stands at about 95 acres now. That's 45 acres of islands and the rest made up of the marina plus little lakes, lagoons and canals. The pavilion itself is suspended over a lagoon in the middle of the island cluster. Like everything else in the project, it's pretty big on Canadian content. In fact, practically everything in Ontario Place is from Ontario, even the snowflakes. It got pretty darn cold down here some days for working outside, but you gotta hand it to those guys. They hardly lost a day. Four of the pavilion pods will contain the Ontario Place exhibition, and it should be quite an experience. It's a complete World's Fair level exhibition, except of course that this one is all about Ontario. Sinosphere should be a tremendously exciting building. The shape of the theater alone is unusual, but when you add things like an 80-foot wide compound curved screen and a 24-channel stereo sound system, it becomes a whole new concept in movie theaters. 
I think if people don't plan to spend at least a full day at Ontario Place once it opens, they're just going to miss out on some things. There really will be that much to see. place is going to surprise a lot of people. You really have to be here to grasp the real size and scope of Ontario Place. What surprises me is that we're only now beginning to realize the potential that exists when you live right on the water's edge. Sometimes seems as if all of us in North America have been building barriers between ourselves and the water for the last couple of hundred years. That's one of the things that really excites me about Ontario Place. It has to be just about the most imaginative urban waterfront concept on the continent. The entire Ontario Place site is completely integrated with the lake, right from the seawall to the marina and the canal system that cuts through the islands. I think we're going to help a lot of people rediscover Lake Ontario. I guess you could say we're coming into the home stretch. The opening day isn't very far away, May 22nd to be exact. We'll be open from May 22nd right through to Thanksgiving weekend. And we expect something over two million people down during the first season. The pressure is really on now to meet that opening deadline. That's why I like to get down here, check things over, and try to imagine what it's all going to be like. Okay. Hi, I'm Catherine Naismith. I'm a practicing architect and the president of the Architectural Conservancy of Ontario Toronto branch, as well as past president of the provincial organization. Thank you all for coming. I want to begin the, art, the evening by inviting Carolyn King, former chief of the Mississauga of the New Credit First Nation, to give a welcome. Carolyn. Jim McGwitch, thank you, Catherine. <clears throat> so I'm uh, a member of the Mississaugas of the Credit. We're the uh, uh, original owners, so I have an official obligation to say, officially welcome you to the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. Uh, that we live uh, 70, um, well, well, I say 60 miles from here. It takes me about an hour and a half to get into the city and that um, 
We moved here from this area, actually 1847. So we've been living away for that long. And we've had, we're the ones with the land claim, which we settled in 205 years later. Uh, so at uh, uh, 2010, we settled the claim, received uh, money, thank you. And that, uh, you need to know that it's in the bank uh, and being uh, used, uh, you know, like invested properly. And that um, we, uh, our name isn't credit for anything. <laughs> so thank you uh, for, uh, you know, what do you call it? Compensation. We didn't get any land back, and we didn't get the islands back. So unfortunately, that uh, went with the settlement. But for t this evening and the connection to the water, I heard on the, the presentation there that talked about being at the water's edge. And that I think we all as a people, um, all people, relate to the water in a very unique way, you know, for the beauty, for the water that it, and the life that it gives us, and for the... Um, Mindset, the philosophy of keeping our uh, minds quiet. Uh, that uh, I have an idea too. I said before I'm done, I'm going to make a movie about this uh, land claims and how much it takes. You have no idea what the First Nations people have to do uh, across this country. So, not to do any more. I am an eagle feather holder, uh, which is a what I call and refer to as the, the highest order, like you have the Order of Canada. Well, in order to, to see, receive an eagle feather, that um, it is like our highest order. You get it in ceremony from your peers, and um, done, like uh, mine was done in the public, our, our power that we hold at annually. So uh, fortunate to have, um, you only need one, but I have two. And that's so. Uh, and I, um, just to... Uh, tell you I don't have the language, and so therefore I often say I'm not an elder, and I don't do ceremony all the time, but do enough that keeps me grounded. So on behalf of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and other nations who lived here before, welcome. Uh, I'm going to, in the next few minutes, I'm going to, going to make a few announcements, uh, tell you a little about ACO and ACO Toronto, recognize some special guests, outline the program for the evening, and then share some thoughts about Ontario Place with you. So here we go with the announcements. Thanks to, to Retro Ontario for permission to screen the films this evening. Uh, we are live streaming. We will have a video recording available on the ACO Toronto website in about a week. And thank you to Brand Vision Media for donating the recording of this evening's proceedings, and to Dieter Jansen and Eb Zeidler for the images that will appear on the screen during the panel. Uh, take a look at the screen behind me. Uh, it's Share with us. Please send your thoughts uh, either by email or by tw or tweet to Ontario Place Legacy. Um, if you're interested in becoming more involved in this issue on an ongoing basis, please talk to Ontario Place for All. You pass the table just outside the entrance. ACO Toronto is very pleased to be a sponsor for tonight's event. ACO was founded in Toronto by, in 1933 by architect Eric Arthur and Anthony Adamson. And since we have grown to 25 branches and communities across Ontario, we advocate on behalf of Arch Ontario architecture and cultural landscapes. And over the years, we have intervened in hundreds and hundreds of cases in many different ways, all of which can be summarized by the right advice at the right time. One thing we have learned over the years is that the reports of a building's poor condition need to be taken with a big grain of salt. That was how battles for Old City Hall and Union Station began. At a time before there was any legislation to protect Ontario's heritage, those buildings were saved by citizens talking to their governments. Tomorrow, ACO will be celebrating Heritage Week in Canada with a day visiting our MPPs at Queen's Park. You can be sure Ontario Place will be, is on the agenda. Um, 
ACO Toronto's biggest project is the online database TO Built. We have 11,000 entries on Toronto buildings, uh, and we really want all the architects in the room to think about posting your projects there where other people can find out that you did that. I'd like to recognize some very special guests. We are honored to have Ontario Place architect Eb Zeidler and his wife Jane with us tonight. Eb's 93, so we're not asking him to stand up. <laughs> um, we have, uh, we are expecting Councillor Cressy. Um, Adam Vaughn gave his regrets. He's busy in Ottawa this evening. We did invite Premier Ford and, and, and the Honorable Michael Tibolo, uh, Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport, as well as Mayor John Tory, but we didn't, get, we didn't hear back from them. I'd like to acknowledge ACO President Leslie Thompson, who's here. Vice President Kay Elgie, and past President Richard Longley. So, the order of events. The evening will proceed as follows. Following my remarks, we will hear short presentations from our four panelists, Michael McClelland from Heritage Planner and founding partner of the ERA Architects, Carolyn King, the Moccasin Identifier Project, Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation, George Baird, architect and partner Baird Sampson, Newart Architects, and Philip Hastings, architect and partner, Gao Hastings Architects. Annabelle Vaughn, who will be moderating the panel, will give a more detailed introduction of our panelists. We will, we will um, conclude at 8.30 with remarks from Toronto Society of Architects President Maria Denegri, and then there'll be more Ontario Place videos to send you on your way. The title of tonight's evening, Ontario Place Building on Our Legacy, invites the provincial government who act on behalf of all Ontarians to reject options that would sweep aside a place with so much cultural value. Created by us from nothing, a legacy which holds not just the significant architectural landscape design ideas and form, but is a touchstone for the memories of several generations of visitors. Ontario Place is an iconic landmark and celebration of Ontario a work of genius by Eb Zeidler and Michael Huff, realized through the singular powers of the government of Ontario as a positive force in our lives. This project was widely celebrated when it opened and has continued to be acknowledged as a great work, receiving peer acknowledgement in 1999 with the Landmark Designation Award from the Ontario Association of Architects. In 2017, the RAIC and the National Heritage Trust awarded the first pre of the 20th, 20th, 20th century to Ontario Place. In 2012, it was added to Docomoma's International Register and a less dubious distinction, it was added to the National Trust for Canada's top endangered list. Improvements such as Trillium Park and the William Davis Trail, along with great film screens, screens at the Cinesphere and recent winter programming have brought new excitement and optimism about the future of this wonderfully layered place. My personal wish for Ontario Place is to be able to skate with my great nephews and nieces on the lagoons under the lights of the pods and the Cinesphere. I want to share with you some of Premier John Robart's remarks from November 3, 1970. We felt there was a need for, in Ontario for a place where people could come, see and reflect upon the society that has been created in Ontario a place where we could examine our history, look at our cultural and economic growth, and contemplate the challenges of the future, a place to reaffirm our identity as Ontarians and Canadians. A provincial showcase should, not only, should be not only a place to reflect, but a place which reflects us as, as the way we are. It should be an exciting place, just as Ontario is an exciting and dynamic province, a place brimming with activity and vitality. It should be cosmopolitan to match the cosmopolitan personality of the people of Ontario, a new focal point for our province, a place which offers a tremendous variety of activities to meet the variety of interests held by the people from all across our province and beyond. That was 50 years ago. It's still pretty true today. Ontario Place represents Ontario in a way similar to the Firth of Forth Bridge in Scotland or the Eiffel Tower in Paris. 
Those structures are honored by their respective nations with continual maintenance to conserve those works of national genius. In fact, the continual activity is a point of pride. What we are doing here this evening is taking a pause to recognize the important design legacy that exists at Ontario Place. We're also putting forth the case that Ontario Place is not worn out, nor ready for the trash bin. In fact, millions of dollars have recently been spent on the site. Ontario Place continues to attract as many visitors as other cultural attractions. Just last year, it, ho it hosted 1.4 million visitors. Built into its beautiful skin are the ideals of a generation coming of age in a time of optimism and celebration of this great province, and later a province attempting re reconciliation. These are legacies that must be the starting point for anything this generation may choose to add. Now I would like to Annabelle Vaughn to come forward to introduce tonight's speakers. I, uh, I thought I was just simply reading their credentials, but Catherine has already done that for me. So uh, good evening, I'm Annabelle Vaughn. I'll be moderating the panel. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to tell you the order that the guests will be speaking and the panelists will be speaking, and then we'll get on with the, pa the presentations and then jump into the conversation. So George Baird, uh, will be talking first, and he'll be situating um, Ontario Place in its international significance and sort of um, putting, sort of giving us a, a, the global sort of significance of the site. Next, uh, Philip Hastings will talk. Sorry, I'm a bit out of order because we had them in a different order. I just want to double check that that's correct. Yeah, Philip Hastings will talk and he's going to talk about working with the asset as it is today because he's actually done work recently uh, with Cinesphere. Carolyn King will speak about uh, the importance of the site for the Indigenous peoples of Ontario and the significance of water and the work that she was part of during the Trillium Park revitalization. And finally, Michael McClellan will wrap up that uh, chunk of knowledge talking about the heritage, um, the cultural heritage legacy of Ontario Place and how that plays into sort of the where we are today. And so what I'd like to do is invite George up first to um, start us off. And then we'll get all four panelists talking about some, some things that I've thought about, ideas that I have about Ontario Place and where it should go next and what we should be working towards. And this panel, when I was invited to do this panel, thank you to the ACTO and to TSA, TSA and Workshop Architect, one of the things that uh, really struck me is that as, an, as the architectural community, we have this moment to sort of take Ontario Place into its next version, into Ontario Place 2.0. And what's our responsibility as professionals in the community to do that? It's kind of an exciting moment. With that, George. Yep. Oh yeah, no, that's fine. Good evening, everyone. I'm very happy to be here this evening to talk about Ontario Place. Um, <clears throat> um, uh, the reason I was asked to be on this panel is that um, there's a new book um, coming out uh, sometime this year, um, and the editors of it are Elsa Lam, who's the editor of the Canadian, of Canadian Architect magazine, and Graham Livesey uh, from the University of Calgary. And I understand Elsa is here tonight? Is Elsa here? Maybe not yet? In any event, um, uh, the, the book is, it's a history of architecture in Canada from 1967, um, it's the 50 years after Expo, starting, starting in 1967, going to 2017, um, which is an interesting period. And um, 
uh, a whole group of different, I think there are 12 or 15 of us, each contributed different chapters to the book. And Elsa asked me if I would write a chapter about a series of projects from the 1960s and 70s, one of the earlier periods covered by the book, um, in which a number of interesting um, um, buildings were erected in ca across Canada. Um, and the title for my chapter is Mega Structures and High Tech. Um, and in my chapter, I talk about the fact that this was a very frisky and ambitious period in Canadian architecture um, and includes everything from uh, uh, Moisha Safdie's Habitats at, at, at Expo in 1967 all the way to Arthur Erickson's Robson Square project in Vancouver, which is uh, one of the latest projects uh, in the period that I cover in my chapter. So it's um, an unusually ambitious period um, on the part of Canadian architects in our um, modern architectural history. Um, in choosing the, the projects to be, to be discussed in my chapter, um, I, there, as I, I say, I think I have 13 or 14 buildings. Um, and there were only two architects in all of Canada who got mo more than one building into my chapter. And those two architects are Eb Zeidler and Arthur Erickson. Not, I suppose, a big surprise. Um, and um, and uh, I talk in particular about three projects of um, the Zeidler firm um, from the 60s through the early 70s, um, which the Zeidler firm already had a, a strong design reputation. But in that period, the firm took on an unusually experimental orientation to a series of projects. And so the, starting with um, uh, a new hospital for McMaster University, the McMaster Health Sciences Center, which was a, a completely radical idea as to how a hospital could be designed in the contemporary world. Um, and ending, of course, with Eaton Center, which is um, transformed the, the downtown of Toronto um, uh, in a way which um, did, in fact, introduce a, the kind of idea of a shopping center, a shopping mall, into the center of the city, but in fact did so in a way that preserved all the historical buildings which had been threatened by earlier versions of the same project. So those are the three Zeidler projects in my chapter. Um, and I'm sure Elsa would be pleased if I said the book will be out sometime this summer. Um, the second, between McMaster on the one hand and Eaton Center on the other hand, the, the second of the three projects is Ontario Place. Um, and that's, of course, what I'm here to discuss with you in detail. <clears throat> um, and what seemed to me so interesting was that, obviously, in these years, Ebb and the, the frisky group of associates working with him in his firm were very alert to kind of ideas going on um, in the world of architecture internationally. Um, and in particular, I wanted to point to a kind of whole series of a, a utopian avant-garde, partly in Japan, partly in Europe, um, which came up with a whole series of propositions, many of which weren't even uh, realistically constructible, but which had a very stimulating impact on architectural thinking around the world. Um, and I see Ontario Place as being the Canadian representative of those ideas. This is number one, the McMaster Health Sciences Center that I talked about. And this, of course, everyone will recognize as Eaton Center, the culmination of this sequence of three. Uh, but in between is Ontario Place. And now I'm just going to read you the passage from the manuscript about it. Zeidler and his colleagues continued their explorations on the mega, oh, the mega structure, I should say. A mega structure, it's a term in architectural history which refers to a building which is unusually large, but also has the characteristic of having some of the features which actually make it feel like it's actually a small city. So it has a complex circulation system and a kind of matrix kind of character. So that's what we mean by a megastructure. High tech, on the other hand, 
refers to a kind of architecture which wants to celebrate the iconography of the technology by which the building is constructed. And so those are the two themes which in my experience, Zeidler's uh, firm decided to sort of work with which were uh, so internationally provocative at the time. They continued their explorations on the megastructure theme with Ontario Place, a recreational complex comprising a series of exhibition pavilions and entertainment venues erected partly on man-made extensions of the Lake Ontario shoreline and partly over the lake itself. The scheme, the scheme emerged from the provincial government's desire to emulate the great public success of Expo 67 in Montreal. Archigrams celebrated technological imagery. Archigram was a British um, architectural group. They never got much built, but they uh, produced a tremendous number of very influential architectural drawings. This is an, ar an archigram drawing of a, a competition project that was actually done for Expo, but which was not built. And of course, it's not hard to see the connection between this drawing and the Cinesphere at Ontario Place. Archigram's celebratory technological imagery is powerfully reprised in Ontario Place. And now I come to Yona Friedman. Yona Friedman was another interesting, uh, originally Israeli, but working primarily in Europe in the late 60s. Uh, Friedman came up with the idea of constructing a whole new city in the air above the existing city. And this is one of his uh, famous drawings. So at Ontario, and Yona Friedman's idea of an altogether new city hovering above the old one <clears throat> is equally visible at Ontario Place. Zeidler also brought a sure sense of architectural detailing to this dramatic new icon, uh, sorry, dramatic new iconography which has made Ontario Place an unforgettable Canadian architectural icon of the 1970s. One which is both a megastructure and a triumphant display of high-tech virtuosity. Um, in conclusion, I wanted to say that, um, Michael McClellan may have more to say about this, but it seems to me that this is a building uh, which in terms of its inter international peers could be compared with Richard Rogers Lloyd's Bank in London or the Centre Pompidou of uh, Rogers and Renzo Piano in Paris or Norman Foster's uh, head, head office building for the Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank in Hong Kong. These are, these are also buildings from the period and they are all considered to be major modernist structures in the historical period we're talking about. And in my opinion, Ontario Place belongs in the pantheon of greatness with them. The last thing I would say, we're probably gonna talk more about this on the panel later, but I've been thinking about the kind of reuse proposition. And my kind of plea is to be, you can't rush reuse propositions. You have to be patient. And the example I want to use in this regard is Maple Leaf Gardens, which sat empty and threatened for a, a worrisomely long period of time. And then suddenly, someone, and I don't even know who it was, although a, f a friend of mine was part of the deal making, somebody came up with the idea of combining a downtown supermarket which couldn't have been afforded on a conventional downtown site because it needed such a big uh, piece of land, and an athletic center for a downtown university that hadn't had one before. And they put those two things together, and that was the reuse for Maple Leaf Gardens. Absolutely unforeseeable, and yet totally possible, and actually lives with us today. Ontario Place can do the same thing. Thank you. So these uh, presentations will be sort of a short, sweet nugget just to get us thinking and all in the room together. Next up is Philip Hastings. Uh, 
Hi. Ontario Place has woven itself in and out of my life for 40 years. First as a newcomer to this country, then as a child, and recently when our firm renovated the Cinesphere. My family immigrated to Toronto from England in 1973. And in those pre-Google days, my sisters and I had few images to give us a clue of what our new life was going to be like in Canada. We found pictures, of course, of mountain police, Rocky Mountains, Niagara Falls. But then there were these strange extraterrestrial designs we found of Expo 67 and then the recently opened Ontario Place. I think as kids we probably thought we were destined for a life on the International Space Station. But there's no doubt in our parents' mind that these utopian structures played uh, a role in attracting them to this country, to this new country of big ideas and big opportunities. Canada for us turned out to be a whole lot more fun than anything we could have imagined. What could you not love about the punch bag forest, the snake tube crawl, king of the mountain, and my favorite, the foam swamp? You might leave the children's play area with a few bumps and bruises. As long as teeth and limbs were intact, everybody was happy. As children, as children we did not pay much attention to the fact that Ontario Place was intended as a place for provincial promotion. Uh, eventually, we would learn the words to Ontario Area, uh, place to stand and a place to grow. Almost forgot the words there. <laughs> Uh, over time, of course, this play area would succumb to the likes of the Mind Buster, the Leviathan, and, and the Behemoth. But it's probably no coincidence that this play-based learning that was developed at Ontario Place in the 70s looks a lot like the play-based curriculum that we now see in the kindergartens in Ontario. As the first major renovation of the Sinosphere since it was originally built, the project objective was to revitalize the iconic theater to its previous glory. There were upgrades to the theater, to the entrance lobbies, the projection booth, the sound systems, concession stands, and other visitor amenities. Minor renovations had taken place over the last 40 years. Uh, they were stripped away to emphasize the beautiful, strong, spherical geometry of this building. We carefully studied the as-built drawings of Eb Zeidler and his team, beautiful hand drawings that we then translated into the latest computer three-dimensional software. Eb Zeidler was one of the first architects I had ever heard of. There was a lot of pressure to get this project right, and you're here today. <laughs> the theater contains uh, new seating, new rubber flooring for cushioning and maintenance, Carpet of walls, this was the first, um, hopefully not the last time, that we ever had a chance to decorate walls with carpet. But it seemed wholly appropriate for this kind of project. And atmospheric lighting. This 600-seat theater uh, is differentiated by color. The seats are differentiated by color and function. The red seats predominate, giving richness to the interior space. The black seats have the capability of swiveling, so those on the outer edges of the auditorium get a chance to see the massive new screen that was installed. The walls and the ceilings are painted black for drama, and the space, uh, the circular vestibule is at the front uh, of the theater for exiting and, uh, and entrance to the space. New barrier-free access was provided to the space. Ontario Place was the first permanent IMAX film theater in the world. Today it houses IMAX 3D, 70 millimeter IMAX, and uh, what's called laser projection IMAX systems. There's, hard, there's a hard pounding audio system and pitch perfect sound. These were all technologies that were developed uh, by IMAX in the Cinesphere and in their nearby headquarters in Mississauga. The projection booth was renovated to accommodate the changing film technology where a film reel can weigh up to 600 pounds. It could be five feet in diameter and require a forklift to move it around. The day before the renovation, we gathered with the Ontario Place staff and the IMAX crew uh, to watch the last screening in this space of Graham Ferguson's North of Superior. Each of the two main lobbies has been equipped 
with a new central wall feature depicting the Canadian landscape. The image references the initial, uh, the opening scenes of uh, North of Superior where a plane flies over the cliffs of the North Shore of Lake Superior. This, this image, um, this image uh, moves along the edge of the cinosphere, highlighting the shape and geometry of that space, and it's lit from above and from below. A full-length display case provides space for movie memorabilia. My favorite piece is the leather armored jacket that the technicians would wear when changing the light bulb. The light bulb was so fragile, it could explode at any time into a million pieces. The lower lobby was transformed for food concession, and blocks of red and blue color were used to enliven the space, uh, which is otherwise understated to highlight the film, which is on display. The project was completed in 2011, just weeks before Ontario Place closed. We had just finished the final deficiency list with the contractor, and you can imagine how we felt when the space was closed. However, as chance would have it, it came back to life in 2017 when they called us in to renovate again the projection booth, this time for new technology that had been developed in the space while the building was closed. Any building that, that require, any building would require substantial renovation after 50 years. But what's remarkable about the Cinesphere is that without any major structural alterations, it can function today as a state-of-the-art movie theater, even with the huge changes that have taken place in film projection. The children's play area might never be resurrected, but if the Cinesphere can come back after 50 years, other structures at Ontario Place can certainly be salvaged. I've got a lot of memories of Ontario Place. Uh, it was born short, it was, it was uh, built shortly after I was born and my life has run in a sense parallel with it. So I decided to ask my 11 year old daughter what her memories of Ontario Place was. This isn't quite fair, of course, because the place is being closed or partially closed throughout most of her life. But of course, she has very little memories of any, if any, of Ontario Place. And I think it's time to start creating those memories down at, Long, at, at uh, Ontario Place on the lake. Thank you. Next up is Carolyn. I think it, we're just going to press. Okay. All right. Uh, the moccasin identifier project, you might all wonder about that. And that I'm the one who walk, goes around this area right now, sort of the great, greater Golden Horseshoe area. And um, I go to schools, and the idea I have, uh, I want to change the world. I want to change our world. I want to see us included in the future of any design. When I was, I was, uh, I was employed by the First Nation Council, uh, when we were invited by the ministry to come down and give input, I was at the uh, conference center when Minister Sean Chan uh, presented the idea about the, the trail in the park. And he presented and he said, you can give your input. I was first. I was the first one to put up my hand. And I said, if you're going to build anything new in this province, you need to include the First Nations, and I'll help you. So they, thank you. The, um, so we started. I was, uh, I was the rep for the First Nation on the design team and that we went through the process. And the, um, the moccasin identifier was already something that we were doing and had started. And it was, it's um, simply an education awareness program. We're going into the schools during the spring, mainly. You can go any time, but that's our target fo uh, focus around the spring. And that the classrooms of this province will research whose land their school is built on, near, or what treaty area they're in. 
The school kit would include those. And it will include four moccasins. I got a little board here uh, that has the four stencils that we've uh, researched through the Bata Shoe. Uh, and that we have, uh, they would get one of those four stencils, they can stencil onto the ground. It's in wash away paint. It'll go away and they'll do it again next year. And I said, they will forever know whose land they're on. We have been lost in this presence. So when I start out my moccasin identifier project, I go out, go out and uh, do talks all over the place. I say, if we as First Nations people do not get a marker on the ground today, we will be lost forever. We just, I drive here, I don't see ourselves. Where's our symbolism? Where's our stuff? I just keep asking and asking. So this little project, simple little project, I said, I have a dream too, that this province is going to be covered with markers and identifiers within, within the next decade. And they will forever know whose land they're on. And we're going to start with, we're going to start over with the kids. So just to move on, make sure I got it right. That's the stencil that is at the uh, Ontario Place entrance. It's a Anishinaabe stencil. Uh, we're Ojibwe, uh, Mississauga is Ojibwe. And that you see the center seam, that actually center seam, that center seam is described, uh, uh, describes the people. Ojibwe means gathered up, puckered seam. Not everyone can do that, uh, say that, that their footwear identifies them, but this one does. Uh, that's, this is a um, design by uh, Philip Cote. Uh, he did his research. He did the drawings of the, uh, this is an actual moccasin at the Battle Shoe, and that he uh, did the stencils. And we're just on a rollout uh, funded by the Ontario, um, the Greenbelt Foundation, to develop a marketing plan and um, spread it to the, uh, the whole area. There it is on the entranceway. If you've been there, uh, that's the moccasin. I, when it opened, I was just overtaken by what I saw there. The fire pit, the meandering walkway. When I was on the team and they talk about what, what, do you, what would you like to see there? I'm going to go back one. And I said, you know what? We as the First Nations people of this country, we come to, and we're the landowners here. We come to this land, fire is part of our ceremony. Part, fire is part of our life, yet we cannot light a fire and carry those out. We sneak over, don't tell anybody. We sneak over to the island. <laughs> and we do it. And that, um, oh, and we got wieners beside us too, right? That's the rules. We gotta deal with the rules. Uh, so, a fire pit, natural, symbolism that includes us. I'm all about visualization. It's time that we as First Nations people start to see ourselves on this land. The fire pit, the Marandine walkway, can go back one, not that one. And that, um, so when I was describing to a lady that um, this is what, uh, you know, that that's what came, became at the, the uh, Ontario place. And she said, I think they built it for you. So it's my place. <laughs> I call it mine now. <laughs> and that um, there's, um, those are other things, yeah. What I'm gonna say, I'll go back to the fire pit. What I wanna do is read. When you talk about what it is, you know, I'm out there, I represent the First Nation on a lot of things. And like you said, I'm a former chief. I sat on the land claim process for this, for the, Toronto Purchase, 1805 Toronto Purchase. And that's so, when we talk about what, and, and I actually get asked this, what do you want? What do you people want? That's a common ask. And that, um, you know, sometimes we don't know what to say. But I, I have come to say, first of all, we want to be recognized that we're a people, we're still here, we were there, and we're still here. And it's time to start to recognize and give us some respect as a people of this, original people of this land. There's this project that we're doing at home. We have an arb, we have a powwow every year, and we're building a new powwow. And this, we started this project to build a new one, an architecturally designed one. Um, I don't have a picture of it, but I want to read. I had a summer student. The construction was underway last year. And you know, like I think somebody mentioned, you can design it but you can't always build it. 
in which case our, our arbor didn't get built. Uh, the architects will understand that it's the grid design, the curves, wood, all of that. Susan, uh, Catherine can des describe what we got that isn't finished. We're finishing it this year. But anyway, I asked my student to read, to say, um, uh, keep track of it, keep track of it. And so um, she did, and she's taking pictures, and she's draw saying things, uh, documenting things. Then she got sick, and she had to leave. So she left the paper to, for me to review. And I'm like busy trying to get the event going in August. And so I finally picked that up, and I'm like, oh, crap, I got to do this myself now. So I, I, I read it, and I couldn't believe what this young person wrote. And that it, when they say, what is it that you want? It encap I, I think it encapsulates what we as First Nations people want. So I'll just go through and uh, read her thing. And it, it'll tell you, what is it that you should be doing? If you're designing something and you're going to include the First Nations, you include the Anishinaabe, here are some ideas. And what it's going to mean to us. In today's world, it's easy to get disconnected from our roots. As Anishinaabe people, we need to connect with each other so our values and beliefs may be carried on. Being Anishinaabek does not simply mean song, dance, images, language, or even blood. It's much more than that. It is the natural world we live, understanding that there is an unforeseen world and remembering that everything is living. When we start to explore protecting our identity and who we are as a people, it brings us back to our, our original purpose, being one with Mother Earth. Protecting her and making sure there are enough resources for future generations. Through this, we are also protecting our ceremonies, our practices, and respecting that every little thing has a purpose in this world. Being indigenous is not a spectator sport. It is a lifestyle you live. So let's start working together to bring all of our knowledge into one place. For learning, one place we can truly show this is who we are. We will not tell you how to be indigenous. We can teach you how to feel confident and accept that as an indigenous person, you have the spirit within you to make sure our ancestors are never forgotten and that our youth will always be remembered. We partnered up with the, the University of Waterloo School of Arch Architecture and came together to work on, in collaboration to construct the new arbor. See, you might go look at it and you'll just say, well, that's just a pavilion, it's just this, you know. We can build that in our backyard too, but it means a lot more to us. For the university students, the collaboration with the, the First Nation is an opportunity to learn about Anishinaabek culture and to get to know some members of the community. It is also the opportunity to use their design skills and construction knowledge to help create a beautiful arbor structure that they hope will reflect and resonate with the community and provide a place for cultural gatherings for years to come. Uh, new MC stand, uh, more trees planted, uh, and the focus of that grove is if we care about the grove, we should also care about everything around it to, to, so that it is connected the life of the grove is not just the arbor, it's the plants, the animals, all living things in and surrounding the grove. We want to build a new one. Just think about when you're designing some new stuff and you want to include us. Uh, sacred three fires in four directions, medicine garden, space for all crafts and food vendors, entertainment stage for our community talent night, and special events throughout the year, plenty of seating throughout. A cultural village will be an outdoor learning facility consisting of traditional wigwam, fire pits for cooking, smoking, and the medicines, tools and materials used by our ancestors, as well as the start of a nature trail that will link up to our school. The purpose of this project has many aspects. It would not only continue to provide us with the resources that we would use for our cultural practices, but it would also create opportunities to understand what we as Anishinaabek people would require to be a thriving First Nation. Although there are many unique First Nations, we are all striving for the same purpose, to live freely and respectfully in today's modern society. Through this project, we as Anishinaabe people need to recreate spaces to reflect our origins, our culture, and existence. Everything is connected, and we want to start putting these words into action and learn how to listen to all living things. 18-year-old Jenna Butler from Mississaugas of the Credit. Last few comments. Uh, what's the future? I want the next generation 
to live with knowing whose land they're on. I believe that the Moccasin Identifier Project that I mentioned earlier is going to help make that happen. And that if we see a future landscape, I have a dream that we're going to be included there. We're not just forced upon, it's not forced upon you to do it, and that it's not just novelty that you add, that we can become part of it, and we can help you. Why not a new museum? Why not a trail that connects us all? We're working with many groups, the conservation authorities, and that if I have my way, there's going to be moccasins up every trail, every street, and that uh, people will ask, what is that? And people will get to tell the story about who, we, who the original people are and where we are today. Jimmy Gretsch. And now, Michael. Thank you to the other speakers tonight, and, and um, thank you, um, Eb and Jane, for coming tonight. It's totally wonderful to see you. Um, I thought I'd start um, just by uh, talking. Uh, I was asked to talk about heritage, and I didn't exactly know what that meant in this context. But I, I was going to start by saying that um, heritage is looking after stuff. And, and George's comment about things take time to actually figure out what you want to do, all those things are, that's totally appropriate. It takes a while to figure out what to do. And maintenance of heritage things goes on for a very long time. So I thought I'd start with Ontario, uh, with the uh, exhibition place. Because if we're going to save Ontario Place, we've got to save Exhibition Place. Exhibition Place um, isn't owned by the Ford government. It's owned by the City of Toronto. Um, and the City of Toronto has responsibility to look after it. And I've got to say, it's one of the most dreadfully managed places in the world. Um, this is the Bull of a Tower, which was demolished to make room for a racetrack. Um, it was, uh, when Exhibition Place was done in the 1920s, it was designed in a very bizarre plan by Chapman and Oxley, really respected architects. Um, now the BOMO field sits plump right in the middle of that axial plan. Um, there's a hotel called Hotel X, which maybe means they couldn't figure out a name for it. Um, there was the almost a total demolition of the E.B. Cox uh, sculpture garden. And God knows what to think about medieval times. So, but, but there is, there's a sense that there's a sense that we really um, don't know what we're doing with Exhibition Place, and I think the history of the two places are very much combined. There. So Ontario Place, um, and I, I agree with George Baird that this is like the Pompidou Centre. Uh, it has that it has that caliber of, of quality. It's an, a magnificent um, enterprise. And uh, I, I, first, I'd like to give a bit of a shout out, shout out for Michael Huff, because in a sense, we always think of the buildings. The buildings are so iconic and, and so brilliant, but we don't, uh, maybe don't always recognize that it's also the landscape that works. There's three uh, man-made islands that are here, um, and all of the um, landscaping is very carefully considered to create microclimates and very specific zones. You kind of get lost in it. If you knew Michael Huff, um, he was a, a brilliant Canadian landscape architect. And his, um, he was uh, from the period which was also revolutionary in the sense that uh, landscape wasn't just designed on its own anymore. Uh, landscape was integrated and designed. So uh, landscape architects like Sazaki and others thought it was part of their job to collaborate with architects and actually be equal partners with architects. And so this is an equal, I think very much an equal partnership between um, Michael and, and Eb. Um, and it's a, a marvelous creation. And you can look at Michael Huff's work and, and understand that he had a very strong interest in 17th and 18th century gardens. But if you actually look at Ontario Place, the wandering and the meandering you do, how you discover different places at different times, is based on, on that kind of history. Um, he's, uh, through Toronto, you, you see many of his designs, like Philosopher's Walk, and you don't notice it because it has a certain naturalness to it. University College Quadrangle, who everyone's always thought it's always been there, but no, that's Michael Huff. So I think, I think understanding the, the quality, uh, not only of the architecture, because the architecture just speaks so much for itself, but understanding the larger context of this. And I would say that the, in terms of heritage, 
the province of Ontario has gone through a process. They have to go legally through a process to understand what the value of their property that they own uh, is. And they did a very detailed description of, of uh, the design value, the contextual value, the design attributes, all these different things that they listed. Uh, and that means that uh, uh, really to understand the changes can happen there, we'll have to kind of comply uh, with uh, those recognized values. And so uh, everything's pinned down quite nicely. Um, the Ministry of Culture's never really overstepped its bounds very much. Um, and so we, uh, we think this could work, but it's going to be a very complicated thing. And just understand big plans and um, uh, George's uh, mega, mega structures. This is Harbor City. And so Harbor City was the next extension of Ontario Place. So Ontario Place, um, I'll just point it out. So um, this was an amazing plan developed, uh, I think, uh, directly with, by Eb and Jane Jacobs. Uh, an amazing plan for Harbor City. Um, and uh, it, it went quite a distance, but eventually died just because of the way things die in Toronto, as many most things die, the tragedy of planning. Um, uh, but there, wh why I'm showing this, for several reasons. One, it provides a larger context of what Ontario Place was attempting to do and what the implications of Ontario Place could be for the city of Toronto. It also means to think through um, how we have to be bold in our visions and have to understand uh, how things might work. So this, for example, provides a huge amount of very interesting housing uh, around Ontario Place, so it would be more like a neighborhood. We have to think that through more and more and more. And I, I think that's why uh, George's caution about taking time with things. It means we need to actually really fully investigate how we want Ontario Place to grow and how we want, uh, or do we need it to grow? Or how do, how do we work with Exhibition Place? And I think the two, again, the two are completely combined. Um, this is a little sketch uh, my friend David Dennis did for me. Uh, last week, um, he, he'd he worked in the planning department in urban design with Ken Greenberg um, 25, 30 years ago. Um, and they were looking very carefully at how to integrate Ontario Place and Exhibition Place. And my God, it's, I mean, it's that nothing's changed in 25, 30 years. Um, this was a quick sketch David did, which was just a, a simple of sort of saying, well, there needed to be a transit connection between Exhibition Place and Ontario Place. And so he just drew a circle. Um, Annabelle and I were joking earlier that this looks like a Ferris wheel on its side, so we'll probably get provincial support. <laughs> but, um, but really the idea is, is, is stunningly simple. There, there needs to be ways uh, to connect and get people around. And if you, think of a, if you think of Exhibition Place, it's 197 acres that has no transit. It's in the downtown core of the city. No one lives there. Um, and it's, it's um, a lot of parking lots. So you really have to think broadly. And it's almost like being a stand-up comic. You have to say, uh, you have to say yes, but um, in stand-up comedy routines. You don't say no, no, no. You have to say yes, but and try to get further, move the, the wheel further forward. Because it's, it's really time for us to actually think about uh, these places together. And this is my last slide. I'm trying to keep this really quick. Um, this is my, uh, my last slide. Um, I, it's, my, it's my sincere hope that the, the, how we deal with Ontario and how we deal with Exhibition Place doesn't boil down to bipartisan politics. Um, that in fact, it has to be thought through carefully. Everyone has to be on side with some significant ideas about how to make change and how to, how to move forward. And heritage is not about freezing stuff or saying nothing can change. Uh, it's about how we can actually make the changes that we need so that it can be sustainable and usable. Thank you very much. If I could get um, George and Philip to join in the panel, I guess I stand here and... One, two, three, four. Oh, there are five, okay. I feel like a bit of a game show host at this moment. <laughs> the dating game. <laughs> so thanks very much. That was excellent. A good sort of synopsis of where we're at 
and situating it a bit. I think one of the things, um, as George takes his seat, that maybe we could start with something sort of easy. Um, where does Ontario Place sit in your imaginary? Um, are there any special memories? I think, Philip, you've already touched on those. I mean, my mom, a single mom in the 70s, used to drop us off at the foot of the bridge and pick us up at the end of the day. <laughs> it was the perfect babysitter, 25 cents admission for the whole day. Um, and I also, uh, I think one of the things that was really remarkable was the forum and the access that we had to it as performers. And I spent a good number of uh, years actually playing a place, uh, a place to stand and a place to grow on the stage with my middle school orchestra. So, and I always thought that was pretty fun. Um, I think, um, you know, we all have those, are the mics on now? So is there, is there a, a sort of memory of your own that you sort of hold? Because I think one of the things is, is there's this incredible nostalgia at Ontario Place, which I think is, a double-edged sword for us. Okay. Well, we weren't there, uh, <laughs> so uh, we, we are. We do school trips here with our children, and that uh, brought my children here to jump in the, you know, the, the balls, and that. Um, but I know when we came down to do the um, theater, the big theater productions that were down in the on the stage there. Uh, that was amazing. And the more recent one was the one we did for the Pan Am Games where it was the indigenous group were there. Uh, that was great to be sitting there on the water and it was a perfect night. So I have lots of good memories of that. So I think including, uh, we were including in, in that big event. So mm. it was great. Uh, for Ontario, the, the Ontario Ario song, I sang at the at Expo in the Ontario Pavilion, so I was part of a choir. So uh, that's my <laughs> that's my bit. But the, the, my biggest memory of Ontario Place is actually quite recent. Uh, I went there for that fantastic art uh, show. Max Dean had, had his all his puppet people set up and everything, uh, and that was absolutely magical um, because there'd been a space of I think ten years or more than that that I'd never been to Ontario Place, and so for it to all come back um, in in real life was was fantastic. Once you get the Ontario Rio in your head, you can never get it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you for that. <laughs> George? Uh, well, I, um, Michael was uh, thinking of it in the context of um, an exhibition place, which of course is in, makes perfect sense. But for me, it was the, it's the excitement uh, to think that the, the the optimism about the future that was so potent at Expo actually reappeared on the waterfront of Toronto in this. The fact that it's all white, the, the, the cables, the, the lightness, the, uh, the fact that the, the, the way the, the buildings reflect in the water, it just seemed to me to represent the most optimistic idea about what the future could be. And I think that was a really interesting, uh, I mean, for me, you know, having grown up with it and, and sort of spent my youth, a lot of my youth there, um, I think one of the things, and then of course becoming an architect, one of the things that I found really remarkable about it was the optimism of that architecture. And I, I was doing some research for this and went through a, a series of uh, old newspaper clippings and found one where Ebb was um, interviewed and he enthused about the need for architects to think more expansively about anth anthropology and sociology as well as art, business and technology. What were the great exhibition buildings that had excited people in the past? They all had one thing in common. Somehow the people who built them showed how technological techniques of the period could be used artistically to solve an architectural problem. And I think that's interesting, but I think one of the things that was so beautiful about Ontario Place is that Eb Zeidler came up with a de deceptively simple vision for Ontario Place. The organizing principle was that you should be able to come to an, an iconic place by the lake where, where your kids could play and you could enjoy a glass of wine. And it worked very well and provided all sorts of Ontarians with aspirational ideas about their futures. Is this still a viable 
organizing principle moving forward. I think that, um, you know, just uh, my experience of working on the design team that did the uh, park, uh, park and trail, that um, as First Nations person, I, I like to say that uh, it felt like we were finally included, that we, that we were asked to participate, we engaged, and I think that they listened and we ended up with something that included us. So in the future of what this place can be, um, I think that we have a lot to provide and a lot to give. Um, and it's my own personal opinion. I don't think a, a casino or a Ferris wheel is gonna do it. Well, I think Carolyn, when we were speaking, you talked about the importance of being by the lake. And I think that that's mm -hmm. such a simple thing and that we often forget about in Toronto. Mm -hmm. But any, is it still a viable, sort of organizing principle, a place for your kids to play and a glass of wine. Yeah, I buy that. I'm surprised in 1960s Ontario you could have a glass of wine out in public. Um, <laughs> but um, It was just, part of the magic. Oh, part of the magic, <laughs> okay. Um, I, I think Ontario plays, the, the magic of being by the water, I, I think means not a hell of a lot should happen there other than that, and I think, um, uh, the Budweiser Theater was a big mistake. They should restore the the forum that had been there. Um, but I think I think none of this can happen without the considering the huge blockage of exhibition place, which means it's inaccessible. Mm. It's really hard. It's really hard to get to, and there's no there's no kind of mixes of uses or anything like that. And so this mixes of uses should happen with Ontario, Exhibition Place and Ontario Place working together, which I know um, um, has been a problem for, as I said, 30, 35, 40 years. So how we get through that um, that issue is is tremendously difficult. But I think Exhibition Place as it's, as and as George described, it's like the Pompidou Center. It's like, so you don't, you don't mess around with that stuff. You actually, that has incredible value. And, and it's a value just um, to be by the water um, to be in this amazing park uh, that's a modern park um, is fantastic. It doesn't really need a heck of a lot more, but it needs access. Um, yeah, glass of wine and kids go together very well. Um, what, what, what is unique about our city is it's a three-sided piece of geography. Um, we have city uh, east, west, and to the north, but we're never going to have anything on the south, and that's what makes this piece of the world very unique. When the weather gets hot um, and the sun is out, it's a natural place for everybody to go. And there's no doubt that the waterfront uh, is our great amenity. I would just add to, I don't, I think everything that's been said is, um, is true. I would just say that it's, it's obvious to me, uh, I'm pleased by the way that Michael mentioned uh, Michael Huff because um, the landscape is such an important component, and of course, it's it's the landscape that that links us to the water. So, and that characteristic of it pretty much takes care of itself. Um, and of course, uh, the children's play and the glass of wine, um, those aren't haven't gone away, and they're not going to go away. Um, the the cinesphere has been restored and is a kind of uh, you know, perfectly workable assembly space as it stands. Um, the, the only real component of Ontario Place that needs a new use is the pods, which is an important component of it, and it's, uh, and it's a programming challenge to figure that out. That's why I thought the Maple Leaf Gardens example was so important for me, because I, it, it hadn't occurred to me that it would be used in the way that it was used, but once the idea that it could be used in that way manifested itself, it was obvious that it was a perfect way of using it. So I don't have any doubt that the pods um, can be reused in an equally inventive and will seem retrospectively to have been an obvious way to use them anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so, and the rest of it is easy. So, um, it needs, there, there is an, a maintenance issue that, that is surely the case, but as Michael already, well, the other Michael uh, pointed out, a 50 year old building uh, is obviously going to require maintenance. So I, um, I don't even think the reprogramming 
so much of what happens there continues to make sense that the the need for reprogramming of the the few components that aren't um, actively being used at the moment is uh, a relatively minor problem comparatively. Right, but I suppose that one of the things that's sort of been lobbed over the net is that somehow this place needs to make revenue. And curiously, Ontario Place has always been a mix of revenues. The marina, the beer gardens, the restaurants, Cinesphere, the shopping kiosks. Um, you know, there was, there was a lot of, of, of ways to sort of generate some, some dollars on the site. And I'm wondering, you know, given the fact that there is there are maintenance issues and there are some you know, sort of uh, issues with the buildings that need to be dealt with, but not as horrific as, as they've been made out to be in the press. You know, is it possible to imagine that we can harness enough revenue to support the adaptive reuse of Ontario Place in the future? And are there examples that you've come across of places where this is working? It's, a, it's, an, interest, it's an interesting place to be, but I do think, I mean, the laying down uh, Ferris wheel is actually kind of intriguing. <laughs> you can imagine this sort of slow moving thing that you could hop on and off all the way around and that's, that's the revenue generator. It would be this novel thing. I'm totally playing with Michael. But... You know, <laughs> Annabelle, you remind me of a, a wonderful story about Expo. Uh, Expo was a kind of, um, among other things, a kind of extravaganza of transportation. So they, you know, the Montreal got its metro for the first time in conjunction with uh, Expo. Um, uh, but they also decided that they needed a secondary transportation loop inside the, the Expo grounds proper. And that's why they invented the monorail. And um, I wonder how many people in the audience are old enough to have been to Expo. Uh, certainly me and a few others. Um, I was left at home and um, not there. And, uh, <laughs> and you may remember that one of the kind of remarkable things about Expo was that it was instantly much more popular than they had anticipated it was going to be. So the site was kind of extraordinarily overwhelmed with visitors from day one. Um, so the, I, the idea of the monorail had been that it would facilitate movement through the site on a fairly casual basis. Um, but because the, the visitation was so high and certain uh, pavilions like the American Pavilion you had to line up for three or four hours to get in, um, what they discovered to their astonishment on about the third day of Expo was that people were getting on the monorail and wouldn't get off. Um, <laughs> they would just stay on and go around and of course because the monorail actually penetrated the, 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 the dome of yeah. the American Pavilion, if you didn't want to line up for four hours, at least you could get a glimpse of it from the monorail yeah. as it passed through the, um, so um, the, the, the American <laughs> Pavilion. So, uh, and so after 10 o'clock in the morning, nobody could get on the monorail because all the seats were taken and nobody would get off. <laughs> So on the fourth or fifth day of the operation of Expo, they, they had to undertake drastic measures. So they shut the monorail down and introduced a new system whereby you had to line up at a station to get on the monorail. You were allowed to go three stops. Then the train stopped and everybody had to get off and all the people lined up to get on it there. They got on and they went for the next three <laughs> stops. And so it went for the rest of the system for the rest of the duration of Expo. Public transit as recreation. <laughs> <laughs> so Annabelle, yeah. I think we should build it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, think, I think we've got our next venture, Michael. <laughs> so overwhelm it with transit. That's one of the things that's coming up. But I think also one of the things to, that I found quite remarkable is that Ebb wasn't asked to design Ontario Place. He was asked to renovate the Ontario Pavilion, which was off in the uh, left-hand corner of, on, of, on, of the CNE. And Ebb, through his persuasiveness and his charm, uh, walked it through to a $23 million project on the waterfront. And I think that the thing that we forget about the profession that we all 
have our hands in is that there is this moment where architects can be very persuasive and visionary. And so what is that vision? You know, where, where is the sort of sweet spot? Because I think there is something, as you say, Michael, in pushing uh, the city towards partnering and sort of leading the charge. If maybe if they're leading the charge on the CNE and we, Michael and I start our fifth horizontal Ferris wheel that we, <laughs> <laughs> but we need to spark that imagination. And I'm just curious if, if there are places where you see that we can move the needle forward, right? Can and, I comment on that? Cause yeah. I think, I think, um, uh, it's a question of leadership, and I think leadership has to come from the design community. I think uh, students and designers, they, have, they really have to push forward, and they have to be collaborative, and they have to stop saying no to everything. Um, I think that's leadership from the design community is very, very important. There also has to be leadership from the political community, and I think that's we have, a, we have some significant problems there. Um, there has to be leadership from the city's planning department um, to actually sort of say, let's, let's, let's work with this idea. There has to be leadership from uh, the um, the governors of exhibition place, uh, whoever they are, uh, because I think we need we need everyone to get together uh, to promote good ideas, and we have to uh, be open to good ideas. And I, I find uh, Toronto um, gotta say Toronto uh, sucks at supporting good ideas, um, and we have a real problem with uh, with. Um, um, being able to collaborate and cooperate and push good ideas up a hill. So there's a lot of naysaying in Toronto, which I think is very unfortunate. And this is going to, this is going to be the epicenter of saying no, I think, Ontario Place and Exhibition Place. We've got to figure out ways to, to change uh, our approach uh, to design and design ideas. And we have to be, um, like the idea of the, the Ebb came forward with uh, the, that massive housing scheme around Ontario Place would be just, uh, uh, people would faint today if someone proposed that. But I think that that's, that's kind of, we have to have those kinds of ideas and we have to, have to be able to discuss them. But I think, uh, Carolyn, you know, your experience with Trillium Park was incredibly um, rewarding. And, and that that sort of slow methodical bridge building amongst the stakeholders groups produced a really fantastic uh, venue. Yes. Yes. Well, the I, I can't say that I have an example of uh, what would make money. Uh, when I talk about this uh, area here, you know, I mentioned earlier about how I want to make a movie. <laughs> that I already got the title. It's called To the Water's Edge, A Matter of Interpretation. I mean, I don't know how to make a movie, but uh, we'll figure it out. I don't <laughs> have much time, but you know, just what, will, what, what should it be? Um, I'll, I'll say the water. Is, is the attractor. Well, and I think yeah. it's very compelling. I mean, 1.4 million visits to Trillium Park last year, 1.5 million visits to the CN Tower last year. And they want to see the The water. other thing that's interesting as well is the Cinesphere has reopened mm -hmm. and it hosts yeah. upwards of 175,000 people a year. The arts events are attracting, in future, run by Artsman, attracted 15,000 people. So it's clear that it can be simple but it needs to be visionary in its simplicity. And I think that's a real challenge. But I do think it's, you know, there are 31,000 posts right now for the Ontario Light Festival that's being held at Ontario Place. And that's more than the Budweiser stage has. But I think the Budweiser stage produces revenue, produces people get down there. It's a different, it's a different segment. One of the things I think we have to think about is that it did bring people in from all over Ontario. It was an attractor. And so that broader appeal, and I think, Philip, I think this, this idea of this sort of three-sided entity that's around the lake yeah. is a very interesting one. Yeah, we shouldn't forget that there is, there is progress taking place at Ontario mm -hmm. Place. Trillium Park is, is a fantastic new addition, and, and I understand there are many more ideas to come and, and have been planned. But, but we shouldn't wait too long either. I mean, generations will go by that have no memory of the place. And then it, it's very quickly, you know, it's very easy to erase it at that point. So we need to work hard and we need to work quickly to, to move forward. And Trillium Park is fantastic yes, it development is. in that way. Any sense, George, of where those visionaries might be, where the megastructure, where the archigrams and Ebb Zeidlers are the, today? Uh, well, we're in a different period and um, 
Um, and, 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 you know, Ontario Place is not the only one of these projects that's um, having some difficulties. I mean, the government of British Columbia has not been kind to Robson Square. Uh, so um, I can't, I, I wish I could, I wish I could, um, uh, you know, be more optimistic, but, um, but it seemed, it, I mean, I think, I mean, Carolyn has mentioned several times the water and I'm, th I'm thinking we wouldn't, you know, one of the reasons that Harbor City did not go ahead was that we had, you know, we had by that point decided that that much filling into the lake was, you know, however interesting the scheme was, was no longer uh, an appropriate proposition. Um, and, but if you look at the way Ont Ontario Place modifies the lake edge, it actually makes the, 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 the amount of landfill which was done at Ontario Place actually made the water's edge more public and more accessible than it was mm -hmm. before mm -hmm. because it was just a, a kind of you know, rocky beach and, um, and um, uh, what am I thinking? Break the, con water. the breakwaters, thank you, um, which um, served a purpose, but were, were not gracious. Um, whereas, of course, the kind of undulating and somewhat complex articulation of the water's edge, which was accomplished by Michael Huff, actually made the, the water's edge habitable in a way that it, it had, it's, it, in that regard, is like an elaboration of the Toronto Islands. So I, um, uh, I mean, I think, I can certainly see lots of ways of going forward. Um, I, I, I would love to be able to sort of tell you the brilliant idea, um, but <laughs> if I could do that, I would be the owner of Maple Leaf Gardens, and I'm not. <laughs> so, I did want to, let me just say, by the way, that, I mean, obviously revenue makes sense, and the, the enumerations of the sources of revenue that you listed a few moments ago are all, I mean, obviously there are gonna be ways of making money on this site, but I mean, I would I would make an argument. I mean, there's revenue and there's revenue. Um, you know, one one could one could build the whole thing condominiums. One could do that, and that would generate revenue. Um, um, but that's a, a, a completely different order of proposition, and one that I do not think anyone is in favor of. Well, I think the notion of revenue is a like gentle revenue. Gentle revenue. Right? In, the, in the same way we're looking for gentle density out in, out in the, the sort of 1950s suburbs of our city, we're looking for gentle revenue at Ontario Place because I think what, what Ab did was, was very subtle. Right. And, and yet it managed to keep itself going. And so, right. Michael, you know, when we start the Ferris wheel, it'll yeah. be, you know, I think in the cheap. Ferris wheel sounds better and better all the time. <laughs> I, 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 do, I do a question. Uh, if you think of Ontario Place as a park, how much do parks have to reven generate as revenue for them to be successful? How much money does High Park raise? So the question is, so it's just a question that there are facilities there, and presumably the facilities would like to break even kind of thing. But I, I think um, uh, the nature of park space um, um, I think we're getting into a very tricky position if we start to say public space has to pay for itself, park space has to pay for itself. And Ontario Place fits within that, that category, I'm, I'm afraid. And I think that um, we should really think of, of your, your, your phrase is right, gentle revenue, because I think it, it does need some cash to keep it going. Um, but parks are not revenue generating, as far as I'm aware. Not primarily. Not primarily, yeah. That's not their reason for being. There will be ways to make revenue for sure out of this piece of land. It exists in a city that has very high property values. Every square inch costs a near fortune. But what we have to campaign for is to um, to make as much of that space public as we possibly can. And I think that's where, as, the, as members of the public, we really need to get involved. Yeah, and, and also find the champions within the powers that be to to be the people who are pushing that idea and making it making it acceptable. Because that's one of the things that I take away from Ab and that generation of architects is that they really pushed for a visionary and ambitious sort of notion of what the future could be. 
And, and I think that's a skill that we, we kind of, it's a muscle group we've almost lost in our profession, I would say. And I'm wondering if, if there are ways that we might need to begin to sort of build that again. Do you think there are ways that we need to sort of be out there and responding to the EO, EIO, EO, the expression of interest that the... EIO. Yeah. <laughs> Ontario area. <Ariario. laughs> Ontario area, yeah. But, I, it, you know, it's something that I think is really quite a, a charge, right? Is what if, what if you just flooded that expression of interest with just a million ideas? that were just revolutionary, similar to the work that you've done with your 18-year-olds, Carolyn, right? Work that, you know, really galvanized and sort of created a vision for your community, right? Uh, I'll make a comment that um, um, what I, um, all my work here in Toronto here to keep the Mississauga name uh, up front and, you know, been rewarded with the, you know, with City of Toronto Heritage Award for that. Uh, that uh, I, you know, what I see the difference in the the indigenous people and all the settlers is that they want a built heritage. They want to put something on the ground that s sees themselves. Whereas the indigenous people, the mindset isn't exactly the same. Where it's a natural history. It's how you use the land, the water, all of the elements that the earth gives you. And that, uh, and I keep reminding the heritage community. Well, you know, I went to the to the big planning uh, thing with uh, uh, I think uh, Adam Vaughn was there, and I said, you know, got on that deputation of like three hundred some odd people, and all I said to him, I said, I just want you to re to remind you that there was a place here, a space here, and a people here before you. And remember that there's more than 200 years of history here in Toronto. And it's because you can't see it, you think it's not there. So that's what we're trying to do is to bring back through visualization right now that, uh, you know, there's lots to be known about the previous and what's in the ground and uh, keeping the water's edge for the people. And I, and I think it's a profound, that is profound. And I think it's a profound statement and challenge for all of us in this room. The cultural value statement that uh, was written said, Ontario Place was designed as an, as an inclusive public entertainment, educational and recreational space and programmed to reflect the province's people, culture and geography, as well as a vision for the province's future. The site and its entity represents a bold visionary statement of its time realized at a scale and quality that earned international recognition and admiration. And I think it's a really fitting sort of like statement. It, it captures the sort of Ontario Place 2.0. Michael, I just want to ask you if you could just expand a bit more on how much weight that statement has, how it, uh, how it can be used, and if it actually, um, you know, can have a hand in sort of being one of these tools in the toolkit. Yeah, well, that that statement actually has a considerable amount of value because it's it's um, it's um, a statement under the Ontario Heritage Act, and so um, any change that's proposed in Ontario Place, uh, they'd really have to do something called an impact statement, where they'd sort of say, well, this is these are the values of Ontario Place, and we're proposing this, and it's going to alter this, this, and this, and there, there'll be mitigation approaches and things like that. So, there, but there has to be a clear understanding that you're not doing any damage to those values. And um, that's with the province. Um, if the province were to sell the property, then the, the city could actually designate the property using those sets of values to sort of say those are the values they're looking at for any private owner to to, to deal with. There's kind of two, the, the there's the, there's the federal government that has very little control over anything because the British North America Act says property belongs to the provinces. And then the provinces have delegated a lot of authority to the municipalities, uh, but they have, um, they have uh, due diligence responsibilities with, um, with properties that have a certain age uh, and they've been recognized under their process as, as having heritage value. So it's, it's, quite, um, it's quite a well-written document. I think. 
So it's not just a moral persuasion. It is actually a political persuasion. Well, <laughs> we, we have to be careful with that. But, but it's up to the Minister of Culture to, to determine whether the, the, this, um, uh, these statements are being addressed properly. And I think that that's, we should count on that. Okay. Um, I wonder if maybe there, you could talk, each of you could sort of talk more about the, you know, this is going to be directed more at the architectural side of the panel, Carolyn, I'm sorry about that, but the just sort of, you know, what, what is the essence that needs to go forward? And is it, is it all in the built form? Or is it possible that there can be change in the physical structure? Uh, you know, is, is there going to, I think, I, you know, it's a mix of landscape and building. And so I'm just curious if, if you've thought about that or have any thoughts about that. I will make a comment. Okay, good. Yeah. Uh, in the latest uh, special edition of the Ontario Heritage Trust, there's a whole article about Indigenous design coming into play, Indigenous architects, and bringing that into place. And I did a, um, a uh, I do, I work with a lot of students, and I tell people in my, when I go out and present, I said, I've done about eight theses now. I said, I'm getting pretty smart. <laughs> and that uh, from plan, land use planning, uh, design people, the different ones that I've, I've worked with. Um, we can take a, a minute to tell a story that uh, I worked with a student who comes from Bangladesh. He came to Canada, couldn't work, uh, went back to school at U of T, and that he uh, got his landscape design. So he did his thesis on the Credit River in recovering the Mississaugas on the credit. His name is Ali Ahmad, uh, and he's, uh, when I say student, he's not a young person. He was an architect in his country and that uh, he came here and then took new design work and he now works in Ottawa. But uh, after we were done, he got his thesis, he um, was selected, he applied and selected to speak at a thing, sacred spaces, sacred places at U of T. So we went in uh, to present, he goes, Carolyn, you need to come and stand with me. And Ollie's like uh, sort of five foot type person. <laughs> He's not real tall. At any rate, he said, uh, we, we presented how design could be put back onto the landscape that's currently here and that we could include things. And so there was an architect in the community, in the, in the audience, and he, he put up his hand. He said, I want to have a question for the indigenous people. And that he said, I'm, he goes, it seems to me that you just want something back. And, and he said, I'm not from this country. And he said that twice, and I interpreted that as, I don't have the North American hang-up. And he said, if I, you hired me to come, you know, he was, he, as it turned out, he's from Italy. And he came in, and he, he said, I, you asked me to build your building. And he goes, and I put your design on there. He said, is that all you want? Are you going to be happy? And so Ollie said, well, you have to answer that, Carolyn. So I said, I said, you know, I thought, that's the, this is the question, because I'm pushing visualization that we as the First Nations people in this country start to see ourselves. And I said, I really can't answer that question, maybe. I said, but when I think about it, and I think of all the things that our people have lost, I said, it's overwhelming. So when I drive down here, and I look out that window, and I see our design that represents me, I'll feel happy. But in the whole spectrum of things, Maybe it's just right here. It's just the start. So I'd be happy when we start to see our designs, ourselves on the new structures of this country. And so, I mean, I, and, and you've spoken about this quite eloquently tonight, and you've talked about it again and again. And I think it, it, the thing that's really remarkable is that the Trillium Park does, does do that. that. And it, it's quite a beautiful space, and people are coming to it. And the question is, is that, is, is the landscape enough to draw the people? Do we need to expand the footprint? Is, you know, how much of 
the, the slide that's up needs to be there to be representative. Does the whole thing, is it, is it all or none? Or are, are there ways that we can begin to sort of take the principles and begin to develop the next stage? Well, I think that um, I'll go back to the value of the land, the water, the environment, to the First Nations people. And that why couldn't there be a uh, canoe, you know, start to be part of something that includes everybody? The, the uh, Credit River project, we're not el eliminating anybody. We're adding our stuff, our things, the circle, the medicine wheel, doing ceremony, having a, having a, a lodge there that people can come and be comfortable, and native plants. All of those things are, like I can say, are encapsulated at the Trillium Park. And that, uh, you know, that so really, I, so we need to be so more So that's sort of a first step, right? This was yeah. the first step towards this renewed vision. And I'm just wondering if anyone wants to sort of take mm -hmm. on George, you know, is is it necessary for the whole megastructure to exist, or can we begin to metabolize it and, and take it forward? Well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm rather wary of suggesting any of the, the pods or the sinosphere um, should not be retained. Um, um, although, you know, when you were one to sort of look at it in detail, you know, that could be subject to further review. But I'm, I'm very struck by the fact that the landscape is far bigger than that group of buildings anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think we're, we're disagreeing on this panel that the landscape is the, the key to the, the future of the place. And after all, I mean, what Trillium Park is, is a kind of update of, uh, I mean, it's, a, you know, I serve on the Waterfront Toronto Design Review panel, so Trillium Park went through our design review, and I was always kind of puzzled that this looks to me just like part of Ontario Place. And I, to, to be honest, I'm, I still can't tell you exactly what kind of jurisdictional boundary exists between Trillium Park and Ontario Place, but it certainly isn't conceptual as far as I can see. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the, I mean, the land, the landscape occupies what? I mean, we don't have a plan on the screen, though maybe you could find one, but it's like what? Two thirds, three quarters of the site? Um, the pods float above the, the, the lagoon um, and the, and the cinosphere is beyond that. So, so I don't, I don't think you can, I don't think it's necessary to make an argument that the, the, that the cinosphere and the pods are preventing new possibilities from existing. No, no. Uh, I don't think that's at all the case. And as I said, I mean, the cinosphere seems to be perfectly usable. Um, I mean, for me, I, the kinds of questions I would ask are, uh, you know, what about the, the, you know, the large audience outdoor entertainment venue? I mean, I'm not, I'm certainly, I mean, you're not going to be not, going I'm in lining up I'm for the a, Echo Beach? I'm not. A, <laughs> I, I, I can't see an argument for it. In fact, given that Harborfront, where we're sitting tonight, is challenged with outdoor performance events because the housing, so much housing is relatively close by, the, 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 the idea that you could have a large outdoor performance event, which is far enough away from residential, mm -hmm. that it actually could be more robust is not crazy to me, so I would be open to that. I'm, I've been free associating here. I mean, I'm intrigued by um, Carolyn's kinds of suggestions. I, I'd be very interested to know what Brian Young and or, or or Rebecca Belmore would think about this site. I'd certainly be interested to uh, see that. Certainly, that there there are two Indigenous Canadian artists that. Yeah. I hold in pretty high regard. I'm not saying there aren't others, but those are two I happen to be familiar with. Um, so, um, and then Michael makes me think that since the city is in control of an uh, exhibition place, um, and since the exhibition place has, you know, got, is pocked with holes where things have been demolished anyway, I mean, maybe there's some kind of... Obviously, the land closer to the water is more valuable than the land further back. Maybe the maybe the south side of the guard of, of the the gardener should be lined with condos, the way the north side already is, um, at the north edge of, of Ontario Place. 
and there's some kind of land swap uh, that, that um, rescues the land, which is far more valuable, right at the water's edge where Ontario Place is. Mm -hmm. um, and a building which, however much it needs maintenance, probably needs it less than some of the remaining buildings on the on Exhibition Place site. So, um, I mean, all these options are, it seems to me, are open. And I don't see any reason to think that um, um, there aren't, and I, 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 the, the one thing I've learned from Michael McClellan tonight that I think is very important is, is the issue about transit. Um, so even there, you know, the, 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 the streetcar does actually make it to the northeast corner of Exhibition Place. It's so it's not, it's not a million miles away. Yeah. But so. then as a kid, you have to walk for 10 miles. No, no, no. But I'm saying, <laughs> no, I know. No, but but as a kid, that's extending what it felt an, like. Extending <laughs> a, an existing line is a lot less complicated than making a new one. Yes. No, so, I know. I'm being yeah. facetious. So, but. So, so anyway, I, I, Philip, I, I don't have a magic bullet, but it does seem to me that there is an infinite range of fertile possibilities here, which don't entail assuming any of the original pods or Cynosphere need to, to go. That's right. And, and before we even get to the, to, to the Ontario place, the land and the landscape, there are miles or there are acres of parking lots that surround this site yeah. and, 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 and uh, the exhibition site. And, and it should be said the Trillium Park was built on, a, on an asphalt parking lot that was used for um, storing boats over the winter. Um, so it went from a, from a rather underutilized piece of land quite easily to a, to a very uh, useful amenity of the city. But I think I'd also like to say that we can only take an empty, the empty pods, I think, for so long. I mean, everybody in the city knows they're, 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 uh, they're empty. And, uh, and I think after a while, that will start to kind of grate on everybody's, uh, everybody's nerves. I mean, it's fantastic. The Cinesphere is now back, back and running. But what to do with those pods that we all know are, have nothing inside them? the moment. I was going to say the idea about can you change things here and can you make alterations, that sort of thing. That's, uh, we deal with that problem all the time with any, well, Maple Leaf Gardens is an example. Um, what, what you have, the reasons for making changes f are to relate to current uses. So what works for us now as opposed to what worked for us in, in the 60s, uh, 70s in, in Ontario Place. So for example, um, I don't think in the 70s we really thought about indigenous culture. So I think there needs to be uh, that we need an update there because people are now thinking about indigeneity and it's really important and we need to respect it. We need to um, go through that, that process and really, so indigeneity is one thing. I think another thing might be um, uh, this Harborfront has a fantastic artist's uh, studio, glass working studio and things like that. I just recently proposed a while ago that there should be artists live work housing all along the waterfront. And on Ontario Place, you could build a little bunch of units that are artists live work housing. So there'd actually be some artists living at Ontario Place producing art. And that's kind of a, an idea about activating a space that's a different way to think about it be all year round. Mm -hmm. And so there, there are things like that. There's small incremental changes that we could make that would update uh, the, the, the offering that Ontario Place is to the people of Ontario. And they could be all kinds of things, but they'd be additive. They wouldn't be subtractive. I don't think you'd basically sort of say, let's knock down three pods and build artists' liberal housing. No, no, no. <laughs> you'd actually find a discrete place to, to, and there's lots of discrete places around Ontario Place. So there's all kinds of things that we could do that would be, um, I think, necessary ways to update uh, the, and activate uh, Ontario Place and, and get more people interested in, in going and being there. Mm -hmm. I also read somewhere recently that the water quality around Ontario Place is as good as it is out at Hanlon's Point. And the notion of actually being able to swim in, you know, when I grew up in Ontario, you, you know, if we fell out of the sailboat, my parents would like grab us desperately and put us back in and we'd be, you know, showered within an inch of our lives and scrubbed. And, and so this notion, when I came back to, Van to Toronto, after 25 years out on the West Coast, that you could swim in the lake was so foreign. But this notion that you could actually access water from a park at the south edge of the city is so mind-blowing. I think it's an interesting one. So I think, I mean, I think in taking away from what has been talked about tonight, that there is this sort of 
uh, potential for a metabolic transformation of Ontario Place and that the landscape um, resonated in that in a big way and that together with the buildings and the landscape that there is a way forward. And I think, you know, taking a cue from Ebb and finding those champions <laughs> who will, you know, move it forward and get it out of the dusty corner of the CNE and take it forward into Ontario 2.0 will be quite remarkable. I just want to make a comment that, uh, you know, we talk about inclusion. Uh, I was thinking when you were reading the statement about, you know, 50 years ago being cosmopolitan and uh, representing all the people here. So now today uh, in uh, 2019, uh, we're still here and... Uh, We've maybe forced our way back in through Supreme Court rulings, you know, that we have to be talked to. And that, uh, but the other part is, there's a whole group of people who may not be here tonight. Yeah. The, the new immigrants. That if, if the fi next 50 years, and it's going to get built for the next generation, I think they need to be part of the picture. We need to be part of it, and they, they do too. Well, and I think that's an interesting point, and maybe it's one that we can let, we can end on, because in the way that you've brought fire and water together at the water's edge, and the way in which Park People uh, has, you know, taken the pizza oven, which has shown up in every neighborhood, and out in Thorncliff, it's turned into a non-oven. You know, Wasega Beach is inundated with South Asians who go bring their barbecues and sit on the beach and barbecue. And so this notion of, you know, making it an attractant to the newcomers as well and bringing them down to the water's edge is pretty remarkable. And, you know, if a new generation of kids could learn how to swim at Ontario Place, that would be pretty brilliant. <laughs> so uh, in, uh, you know, because time is of the essence and tonight has, there's a couple of more things that will wrap up the night. Thanks very much to George, Philip, Michael, and Carolyn. Nice to see you again. Yeah. <laughs> we see and each other often. And I believe that Helena. Nope, somebody's coming up from the Toronto Society of Architects. And they'll be uh, finishing up some concluding remarks, and then there will be another film uh, as we head out. Yeah. Are you sorry? Okay. Hi. Oh, sorry. All right. Hi. Just a few quick um, words before you all depart tonight. I wanted to just thank the speakers, thank all of you for attending, volunteers, as well as our sponsor, LRI. Um, we should acknowledge that um, Land, Land Art Inc. and Westgate were um, assist, worked with Carolyn on the design of a Trillium Park, and I know they're here tonight. A um, lot of inspirational words were spoken tonight, uh, a lot of enthusiasm about what the next steps may be. Um, for us, um, I'm the chair of the TSA. We are one of the kind of co-hosts of the evening. Um, this is the first of two events that we are going to be hosting um, on the topic of Ontario Place. The next will take place at the end of March um, in the form of a public charrette. Um, so we are asking for those, um, you know, for many of you to come to attend. Um, and um, it will give you an opportunity to participate and put your thoughts to paper um, and be included on what a kind of potential vision for Ontario Place may be. So this kind of um, call to arms, so to speak, um, and the kind of public interest, um, we hope that you participate. We will be um, putting information about this event in our website. Um, so I encourage you all to visit the Toronto Society of Architects website for more information. Also, just on a note, um, you know, plug for the organization. We are a nonprofit group. You do not need to be an architect to be a member of the Tor Toronto Ontario Society of Architects. Um, and we encourage public, the public and members of the community to, to join. 
it's an advocacy group that really our main interest is to make sure that um, architecture design is at the table when um, there is policy to be made and important um, topics are, you know, are are on the, are up for discussion. So thank you for coming and hope to see you at the end of March.